Church. Good morning, disciples. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 21. You know I'm going to. The Lord has put some things on my heart this morning. I'm just grateful to be standing in front of God's church. Not the Church of England. Not the Catholic Church. Not the Presbyterian Church. Not the lukewarm Baptist Church around the corner. I'm grateful to be preaching to the kingdom of God this morning. I'm grateful to be preaching to the Birmingham disciples who have traveled down. I'm grateful to be preaching to Alan Francisco, who has traveled all the way down from New York to start dating our incredible sister, Betty Danso. There is no social distancing on love, guys. 3,412 miles traveled so that God can be glorified. That's incredible. That's incredible. I thought Joseph did an incredible job at the contribution. I almost collapsed. Man, that, bro, best speech I've ever heard you preach. Best ever. Best ever. And do you know why Joseph has grown as a preacher? Trust and obey. Do you know why Novella has managed to get to where she is as a disciple? To be fruitful, what was it? Six, seven times? Three family members come into the kingdom? Trust and obey. Now, you heard the lyrics to that song. So I've got to ask you a very simple question. Are you happy in Jesus? Today, are you happy? Because happiness is simply a question, do you trust and do you obey? Trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not to get what you want, not to force your smile not to flatter and deceive and to say everything is okay. Not to pretend to be happy in Jesus. Not to be confused in Jesus or angry in Jesus or bitter in Jesus. Because honestly, if you're bitter in Jesus, you're not really in Jesus. Are you trusting and obeying this morning? Are you happy in Jesus? I'm happy in Jesus, man. I'm happy in Jesus. How can I not be happy in Jesus? When three years ago, I was a cocaine-taking atheist. How can I not be happy in Jesus? When three years ago, I was traveling the world to sleep with people and cheat on my girlfriend. How can I not be happy in Jesus when I have an incredible, beautiful wife and a beautiful baby boy along the way? My son is coming next week, guys. How can I not be happy in Jesus? How can I not be fired up? When the trust and obedience to the scriptures, to my leaders, to my disciples, to Mia Grace. Mia Grace will come and she'll say something convict. I trust and obey Mia. Because I know she's walking with the Lord. I'm happy in Jesus. Because I just want to trust and obey. I'm happy in Jesus because I know there's no other way, especially not Luke's way. Let me tell you where Luke Snow's way gets you. Nowhere. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get you any friends, I can tell you that. I speak to zero people from the world. From before, I, not out of choice. I wish I could, hey guys, let's, let's go for a coffee, let's study the Bible. They just don't like me anymore. Because I trust and obey. Who's your best friend? Are they in the kingdom? Who's your top five? Are they in the kingdom? Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. John chapter 21. Now I'm going to preach you guys a lesson today. It's not entitled Trust and Obey. That would have been cool and it would have been kind of segue, but it's not. That's not the title. But it's all about trusting and it's all about obedience. Because we are going to sit on discipling. 
until the church changes. We're going to sit on discipling. Do you know why? Because I preached a lesson on discipling last Sunday for the North, and I've had the most complaints about my sermon that I've ever received. The most angry, upset bit of disciples that I have ever received. I'm like, awesome, I'm preaching about this again. I'm not in the mood to make you guys fired up about Luke Snow. I want you to trust and obey the Word of God. It says in chapter 21, verse 1, Afterward, after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared again to his disciples by the sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. And sometimes you've got to kind of figure out which way it happened, especially in the daytime. Ah, oh, bro, I fell into impurity. Yeah, but, but how? how? <laughs> it happened this way. John, the writer of this gospel, needed to let us know that it, it happened this way. Because there's a lot of ways that it can happen. There's a lot of ways that you can stop trusting and stop obeying. But you've got to ask your question, did it happen this way? Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now let me tell you a little thing about Thomas. Thomas is an awesome guy. Right? A lot of people have a bad rep about Thomas. He was the only one of the apostles who wanted to see Jesus' hands, who wanted to see his side, or at least he's the only one that was recorded about that. I'm sure they kind of all wanted to, but Thomas just wasn't there. But let me tell you something about Thomas. Before you start calling him doubt in Thomas, his name was Didymus. Most church historians believe that the reason he was called Didymus which means twin in the Greek, is because he looked exactly like Jesus. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 11. Let me show you how sold out this guy was. Didymus looked just like Jesus. And in John chapter 11, verse 14, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him, to Lazarus, at the place in Jerusalem where the persecution was hottest, where the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus, and the Romans wanted to kill Jesus, the man that looked just like Jesus, in verse 16 says, to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas was sold out. He knew that looking just like Jesus, nicknamed twin, he was probably going to be the first to go. If anyone saw him around the area, he was probably going to be the first to die. So when you go back to John chapter 20, and you see Thomas's heart, when you've been radically sold out, and you've given absolutely everything for the kingdom. And you see it all crashing down in the blink of an eye. Overnight, 150,000 disciples disappearing. Overnight, most of the movement falling away. Overnight, world sector leaders, evangelists, abandoning Kip to go off and join the world. To become denominational. Twins of Jesus. People that had given their life to look just like Jesus. So when it says in John chapter 20, verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, with the disciples, was not there. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, You know, guys, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I just, I just can't believe. Thomas was remnant. He was hurt that Jesus had been lost because he was the most sold out one amongst them. And he felt that pain. He's like, guys, I, I know. I'm trying to stay faithful here. But I, I, just, I, just need, I just need something. I just need to see that God's kingdom is coming back. I just need to see some scars. I need to, I need to see some cuts. And a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, 
Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. This wasn't a rebuke. This was compassion. This was compassion to the remnant where Jesus said, it's okay. I'm back. We're going to do it again. We're going to build God's kingdom. Touch my side. Come home. I appreciate the remnant that we have in this church. We are so privileged to have the Scots in this church. So privileged to have the Hearts in this church, the Corrigans in this church, the Greenwoods in this church, Ola, Hillary, Krista, Jason, Steve, Nick, all of the incredible Remnant disciples. You don't know what they have experienced. I don't know what they have experienced. But I want to trust and obey them. They've seen things I haven't seen. They've given special contributions you have never given. Year after year after year after year, and then it crumbled. Don't be down on Thomas. That guy was sold out. You better trust and obey the remnant in the church. It says in verse 3, I'm going to go out to fish. Simon was a little bit bored. He was done waiting around for Jesus. I'm going to go and fish. We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Sometimes we can't recognize God in our lives. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? I love this guy. <laughs> you guys didn't catch nothing, huh? Without me? Yeah, go figures. And then the teen said, no. You can imagine how these teenage apostles said this. Like, no. You know we didn't catch anything. No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. My favorite scripture in the Bible, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. <laughs> so, I'm sure you guys are wondering the nugget about the number 153. I can see some of you guys have got sweat on your nose. You're hungry. And commentators speak for hours. You can research for hours about what 153 means. It's Pythagoras' theorem of the fish and you get the measurements. It's the one plus two plus three and it equals 17 and that's the number of the apostles in the, in the Old Testament or something. And it's this, and it's this, and it's this. But whilst they are sitting down and trying to figure out what 153 means for hours, the time is ticking that they're not trusting and obeying. See, I don't really care what 153 means. <laughs> All it means to me is that Jesus did miracles, and Peter was strong. And that's all you need to know. Go and make disciples. It doesn't matter what 153 means. These nuggets that you get in your quiet time don't matter if you don't do anything with them. Psalms 119. It says, I have more understanding than my teachers. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. It's not about what you know. It's not about what you do. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The word beginning in the Hebrew is to chiller. It means the very first thing that you receive. Wisdom is fear in the Lord. Wisdom is not a seven-year degree. That's knowledge. Wisdom isn't all the numbers that you can memorize in your mind. That's knowledge. An unfruitful knowledge at that, if it doesn't lead to the fear of the Lord. It says in verse 15, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, using his non-Christian name, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, so feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. You've got to ask the question, why is Jesus asking the question? The first one he says, do you love me more than these? And some people think it's talking about the, the fishermen, the fisherman business, the fish that they're eating. Do you love me more than food? Maybe that's you today. Do you love Jesus more than your breakfast? Maybe that's you today. I'm not going to get into that one this time. I got it last time. Do you love your friends more than Jesus? Do you love your career more than Jesus? That's the question he's asking. But to Peter specifically, do you love me more than these? Why? Because Peter thought that he did love Jesus more than the other disciples. If you have a look at Matthew chapter 26, it shows you exactly what Peter thought. He thought he did love Jesus more than these. It says in verse 31, then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. In verse 35, but Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. In verse 33, it says, even if all of these guys, even if John, James, and Andrew, Nathaniel, Bartholomew, Matthew, even if all of them fall away, I never will because I love you more than the rest of these disciples. I love you more, Jesus. And Jesus is questioning that love for himself because of his love for his disciples. Jesus says, Peter, do you, do you really think that you love me more than everybody else? Because that's not the mentality that's going to get them to heaven. Look to the person next to you, on the right and on the left. How much do you care about their salvation? How much do you care about the salvation of the people sitting next to you? Have you fed them this week? How many scriptures have you shared with the person next to you this week? You guys can giggle and hug and continue doing that. But how many times have you discipled the person next to you this week? How many times have you called them out on their sin? How many times have you fed their gospel? How many times have you told them, why aren't you singing in the fellowship? How many times have you questioned on the things that they're wearing so that they can glorify Jesus? How many times have you asked them, how many Bible studies do you have? How many times have you asked them, why don't you have a guest out to church? How many times have you asked them, why aren't you baptizing? You don't love them. You might hug them. Do you love me more than these? No, you don't. Because if we do not love each other the way that Jesus loved us, none of us will make it to heaven. I can't get there on my own, guys. He says, feed my lambs. And if you are not, you don't love me more than these. Neither do you love them at all. Are you discipling? Are you calling others to trust and obey? Are you fired up to encourage one another and tell them that you're awesome? I'm so inspired by your example, but you imitate none of it. 
The Bible says that you're a flatterer and a deceiver. If you tell me that I'm awesome, but you don't imitate my life, you are lying. If you say you're inspired by Frank Sermon up in Birmingham, but you don't imitate his life, you are a liar, Birmingham Church. You are liars, Birmingham Church, if you don't do what Frank is doing to get where Frank is. The West are fired up. I'm fired up that the West are fired up. But do you imitate Colby and Rebecca? Or do you just tell them that they're awesome? Feed my lambs. Look after my sheep. Trust and obey. The title for today is Feed My Lambs. Jesus asked this question three times. And in the 17th verse, it says the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It says that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. Why was Peter hurt? Because it reminded him of when he denied Jesus three times. When he said, no, I don't know him. No, I don't love him. No, I don't speak that language. No, that's not me. And he denied him three times. And Jesus was asking him these questions to draw out his heart, just like we do in a D time. And it says that Peter was hurt. The word hurt in Greek is lipeo. That's the same word it uses in 2 Corinthians 7 when Paul says, I know that I caused you sorrow by my letter. I know that I hurt you, but it's okay because it led you to a godly sorrow. What was Jesus trying to do in this D time with Peter? He was trying to get him to a godly sorrow. If you don't like the questions in D time, if you don't like the questions in church, it's because you have a worldly sorrow. Because a godly sorrow is a sorrow that desires Closure. It's a sorrow that desires repentance. An eagerness to clear yourself. An eagerness to see justice done. So if you confess your sin and you don't want to be discipled, it's because you don't have a godly sorrow. You're not hurt, lepeo. Just upset. Emotional. Soft. Peter was hurt. And that was absolutely Jesus' intention. Absolutely. You feel hurt by your disciple? Say thank you. Say thank you. Say, what do I need to do to not be hurt anymore? What is the balm in Gilead? You guys know that Kanye West song? Jesus is the balm. It puts it on like pseudo cream, makes it nice and smooth. What do I need to do in D time? Too many of us are satisfied with disagreeing with our disciple, which is okay but not asking the questions to stop being disunified with our disciple, or our Bible talk leader, or our church leader. If you don't agree with their discipling, that is okay. But you've got to continue to ask questions. You've got to be honest. Say, bro, like, I, I don't actually agree with what you're saying. So they either have the chance to go, okay, let me reevaluate, or let me share another scripture. Until we're at a point where we can trust and obey. If you leave a D time not trusting and obeying, You've got a worldly sorrow. You don't really want to change. You don't have an eagerness to see yourself cleared before God. Feed my sheep. Jesus wants us to be a church that disciples. Got my old school clicking. Have a look at Matthew 16. I love discipling. Changed my life. Changed my life. It's a very simple point. Point number one is faithful discipling. Point number two is fatal discipling. And point number three is fruitful discipling. But let's see if the Holy Spirit lets me get to point number three. We're, we're already running out of time here. But Matthew chapter 16. Got a question. Do you love those you lead? And for those of you that, that don't like, lead at a church leadership kind of capacity, region leaders, Bible talk leaders, disciples, do you love the lost? Do you love those you lead? 
Do you love your family? Because those are the people that you lead. Those are your hearers. Do you love those you lead or have your sheep become a burden to you? Can you imagine a shepherd whose livelihood is sheep, whose paycheck at the end of the month is sheep, whose Christmas presents are woolly jumpers, and he's ticked off at herding sheep? Oh, these sheep, man. Why are they so white? Why are they so fluffy? These stupid sheep, why are they eating grass all the time? Do you know how silly that sounds? When you're bitter at the people that you lead, when you're upset at the world for being worldly, what do you expect? The world is worldly. Do you love those you lead? Because it really does begin with the way that you think about those that you lead. It's the way that you see the world. It's the way that you see your disciples would change the way that you lead them. Anyone can change. I want you to write that down. Believe it. Anyone can change. There was this one brother in the North region. <laughs> this is funny because at least 20 of them could go, okay, this could be me. <laughs> Anyone can change. But this one brother, when he first came around, no, I met him on my very first day of ministry. My very first day. I met him at Middlesex University, outside the toilet. It was a little bit uncomfortable, but it was, you know, God's plan. And uh, I didn't hear from him for years. And then two years later, during the lockdown, he texted me. He's like, like I, I really need to talk to you. Can, can, can we get some time? So we came over to my house. We had a chat. And this brother studied and studied and studied. We made him into a great disciple. When he got baptized... <laughs> And he, and he got baptized, and he was a disciple, he, and he was a disciple, <laughs> but he didn't want to come to Campus Devo. He didn't really like church that much. He wasn't in contact with brothers and sisters very often. He didn't go on dates. His giving was sporadic. But just a couple weeks ago, Precious told me he wanted to be an evangelist. Anyone can change. Anyone can change. I, I gotta hit this one. So I also have some conversations with, <laughs> with, with our brothers and sisters, right? Say, I just wanna baptize someone that I get along with. I just wanna baptize someone who's just like me. You know, it's not fair. Paul got to baptize his best friend. This guy got to baptize. It's not fair. I want to baptize someone just like me. That likes the same, same things that I like. The same movies. The same food that I like. And oh, this, is a, this is a quote that I get often. I want to meet someone that I don't have to deny myself to hang out with. <laughs> You've said it though, haven't you? Okay. Anyone can change. You do realize that you were the person that people had to deny themselves to hang out with, right? You realize that. You realize that you weren't awesome to be around before you became a disciple. You do realize that. You do realize that some of you are still aren't that awesome to hang around with. And since you're looking for someone that you don't have to deny yourself, it would be very selfish and very empty church service if we all had that same mentality of not hanging out with people that we had to deny ourselves for. That's the love of Jesus. Self-denial. You've got to get to know. You've got to love the sheep. Some of you are tough to study the Bible with because you complain about everything. Because everything was tough and everything was hard and you didn't want to have your quiet times. I know. I was there. I was an atheist. I always thought my conversion was easy. But I didn't see all the prayer and the fasting that was going behind closed doors. The begging. But like, just please, God, break this guy's heart. He's so hard-hearted, and he thinks he's awesome, God. Just do something to humble him, like seriously. We've all been there, but it begins with the way that you see them. Do you see that person studying the Bible as my future brother? Man, Shay is my brother. Shay is my brother. Like right now, he's a cousin, like, but, but we're, we're close. 
And we had a great date around our house yesterday with Frank and Josie. Me and Frankie invited them around to our house. And Frank asked this awesome question on the encouragement date. He said, what's your favorite thing about the kingdom? And I said, no, bro. My favorite thing is, is how quickly bonds are created. It happens in an instant. I sat down with Shay and I was like, bro, if, if you actually calculate all the hours that we've actually spent together in Bible studies and in chatting, it's only accumulated to 24 hours. We've known each other for a day, and we're best friends. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. But that's because you've got to look at the people the way that Jesus looks at them. When he gets off the boat, he sees the harassed and helpless and has compassion on them. He doesn't get harassed and helpless. He has compassion on the harassed and helpless. And sometimes we're harassed and helpless. Matthew 16, in verse 21, says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. You guys caught that? He must suffer. Do you have that mentality? That suffering is a must in order for you to do God's will, in order for that person to get saved, in order for your family to become disciples. Suffering is a must. Suffer many things, many things, at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day and be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Peter. Get behind me, Satan. What about the guys in your Bible talk? Is it get behind me, Joseph? You're making me struggle. Get behind me, Harry. I can't say anything about Harry. He's always fired up. Let me choose somebody else. No, I'm kidding. I love Harry. Right? Who do you see as the problem? Is it Satan? Or are your Bible talk just not fired up? Is your church just struggling? The people just aren't as spiritual as you. Or is it get behind me, Satan? Stop infiltrating my church. Stop infiltrating my friends. Get behind me, Satan. What is your mentality? When Jesus gets off the boat at Gennesaret, the east side of Galilee, and meets the demon-possessed man in the east. Chris Worth, yeah, that was too soon there. Yeah. Oh, demon possessed. Oh, never mind. <laughs> right? And he sees Legion. Jesus speaks directly to the demons. What is your name? He doesn't speak to the poor distressed man who is naked and cutting himself. Even though it's very easy to disciple the fruit and everything that's on the outside, but he saw that truly Satan was behind all of the troubles. And the same in Luke chapter 22. Faithful discipling. Faithful. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. It says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Simon, that your faith may not fail. And if you have turned back... When you have turned back. Jesus knew for certain that his apostles weren't going to make it through the night. But he knew for certain that Peter would come back. Is that your mentality for your disciples? When they get strong. 
when they start bringing guests out, when they catch the vision, when they trust, when they obey, when they love me, when they love God. Or is it if? If, if, if this sister would just submit to my leadership, maybe the Bible talk would grow. If this brother would just start sharing his faith, then I could be fired up. If this church would just sing, then we'd have an awesome service. Or do you say, when they get fired up, when they start bringing out guests, when they baptize, when they're faithful, when they're praying, when they're loving. Anyone can change. And Peter believed that about the people that put him to the cross. Anyone can change. But Satan has got his hands on your people. Satan has got his hands on your life. He's a roaring lion and he's trying to eat you. Take it serious and don't let a disciple fool around in sin without standing up to Satan. You're not confronting the disciple. You're confronting the sin in their life. Let's move on. As you know, I need to go to this scripture. Let's move on to this scripture. Second Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says in verse 22, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. If you're not pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace, it's because you're not calling out to God with a pure heart and you can't have fellowship with others that are. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everybody. Able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. In the hope that God will grant them repentance. It's hope that God will grant them repentance. Leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. The Bible says that people need to come to their senses in order to repent. When things don't make sense in your discipleship, it's because Satan has gotten involved. You know you've been there. When something in a Bible study doesn't make sense. They've done all the studies, they agree, they're coming to church, but it just doesn't make sense. What's what's not clicking? Satan. I've preached to this Bible talk again and again and again, just, just something just doesn't make sense. Satan. But you have got to gently instruct with hope. We know that Romans chapter 5 teaches that hope comes from character. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, character produces hope. And hope will not disappoint. If you have no hope for the people that you lead, you have no character. If you aren't faithfully discipling, you have no character. And God thinks that you need a bit of suffering in order to be hopeful, faithful leader. Okay. Point number two, fatal discipling. What does fatal mean? It means leading to certain death. And I just want to address quickly what is killing discipling in this church. For those of you that are visiting, discipling is a command of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, it says to teach them to obey everything you have commanded them. 
So we as disciples over our entire lifespan need to be taught how to obey the scriptures. This never stops. This never stops. And it's the command of God. So what's making it stop? If discipling is a command of God, to receive and to give, then what is killing discipling in this church? Romans 13, it can be a lot of things. I've narrowed it down to one for now, unless God put something else in my heart. In Romans 13, I want you guys to tell me what that first word says in verse 1. Everyone. Okay, so I hope everyone's reading. Everyone must submit themselves to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Why? Because who has all authority? Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, if you have any authority, it's because it has been given to you by Jesus. And it's been delegated to you for a purpose by Jesus. Any authority, because all authority belongs to Jesus. There are two words for the word power in the Greek Bible. It's dynamis, where we get the word dynamite from. That refers to the miracles that Jesus performed. They were dynamite, explosive. Or there's exousia, which means authority. And in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, I have all exousia over the heavens and the earth. So if you have exousia, it's because Christ has given it to you. Therefore, if you are not submitting to somebody else's exousia, you're not submitting to God. It says in verse 2, consequently, he who rebels against the authority, or she, or she, who rebels against authority is rebelling against God and what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Everyone is to submit to godly authority in their life. And it doesn't matter whether that authority is correct or not. God calls us to submit to the governing authorities. I don't know what they're doing, and I'm not in a place to judge what they're doing. I don't know anything about politics or vaccines or anything like that. I still got to submit, though. And if I have to submit to the NHS, how much more so to the man of God in my life? If I submit to the stopping at the traffic lights, how much easier should it be to submit to the person who leads me in my discipleship? How much easier should it be? In Numbers chapter 12, it tells a beautiful story of what happens when a sister disobeys leadership. She gets leprosy. My wife's skin is flawless. She's beautiful. Beautiful. She's so pretty. I wake up and I'm, 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 I'm just upset. I was more handsome just so I could be more handsome for my wife. She's so beautiful. But if she had leprosy, she wouldn't be fired up. The sisters value their skin, right? You're going to get leprosy. You know what else happened when the sister rebelled against leadership? Stopped the movement of God. You can check it out in your quiet times. Some of you definitely should. I'm serious. The entire church had to stay where they were until this sister repented. Miriam, in Numbers chapter 12 because she wouldn't submit to God's man. Moses wasn't perfect. He married a Cushite woman. He made a lot of mistakes. He had fits of rage, 
Maybe he makes you angry. But you still got to submit to him. Because he's been appointed by God. The same goes for the sisters that are getting discipled by sisters. If you don't want to submit to the women in your life who have God has given exousia to, you will find yourself only rebelling against God. The forceful advancement of this church is dependent on the trust and the obedience of his disciples. 1 John chapter 4. It says in verse 5, you, verse 4, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. How do we recognize false disciples in the church? Listen. Trust and obey. For there is no other way to remain in Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 28, hey, I'll be with you to the very end of the age if you teach him to obey everything. I'm not saying you're not a disciple if you don't obey. But you won't be with him at the very end of the age. You might be faithful right now. But carry on with your rebellion and your lack of submission to discipling and the scriptures. You won't be with Jesus at the very end of the age. It is inevitable to fall away from Christ if you don't obey discipling. Fatal discipling. I don't want to see people fall away because we're in God. This is what that scripture says. This scripture says if you're not listening to discipling, you're not actually of God because Satan's all twisted up in there. Don't you want to be free from that? Don't you want to be free from your bitterness? Don't you want to be free to the anger towards the other people in the church? That doesn't fire anybody up. Come on. Let's be deeply, deeply honest. How happy do you feel when you're holding on to this hurt that someone else, because they made a mistake? Do we not all make mistakes? Is that an excuse not to listen? Is that an excuse not to trust and obey? Jesus died for your sins. Let it lead you to the cross. Let it lead you to God. Let it lead you to listen. Let us be a church that disciples each other. So that we can listen. So that God can be in us. Point number three, and I'm closing out here, is fruitful discipling. First Peter, chapter one. This is why we're here, guys. This is why I'm preaching. This is why God has put this on my heart. I want to make it to heaven. I want my son to make it to heaven. I want my wife to make it to heaven. I want you all to make it to heaven. I deeply believe in this because I am a product of discipling. I am not awesome. I am not smart. I am not clever. I am not witty. I'm a product of discipling. I am not fruitful. I am not spiritual. If anything spiritual in me, it's because the Holy Spirit is literally in me. I was a drug abuser. I was a physical abuser. I was an emotional abuser. I'm a product of discipling, guys. That's the only reason that I'm standing here. It's the only reason that you're sitting here. And you're a product of discipling. And that discipling has a very specific place where it needs to lead. And if you don't like discipling, 
one more thing to point to. This isn't the church for you. I'm going to be deeply honest. You'll stay upset. This is the church for you if you want someone to come into your life and help you become more like Christ. Because fruitful discipling, <laughs> fruitful discipling in 1 Peter chapter 1 should lead to this. It says in verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see, I love my son, man. I just got a real quick, I haven't ever seen my son. I've seen his foot come out of my wife's belly. But I love him. I die for that guy. I'm understanding God's love on a deep level, guys. Because if Finley is trying to walk and he falls over, I'm not going to rebuke him. If he doesn't say my name right, I'm not going to rebuke him. I'm going to say, try again, buddy. Keep on trying. Keep on going. And is that not how God thinks about you? Does he not look down and like, hey, man, good job, Bible Talk leader. You're not very fruitful, but that's okay. Keep on trying. Keep going for it. Keep going for it. Is that not how a dad looks down at his son? The only reason that I would rebuke Finley is if he was hurting himself. If I saw the things that he was doing in life were hurting him. And in the same way, our Father in heaven, only when we're hurting ourselves does he put a stop to it. But if we just make mistakes, if we just fumble, he's just, keep on trying, buddy. Keep on going. It's okay. I love you. Get up. Keep on going. Make it. You're going to walk. You're going to crawl. You're going to speak. You're going to preach. You're going to be a Christian one day. Get up. Let's go. That's how God thinks about you. There's no time to be upset. There's no time to be bitter. Jesus loves you guys. Jesus loves you. You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of souls. What is the goal of our faith? The salvation of souls. What is the goal of church? The salvation of souls. What is the goal of Bible talk? To bring a bunch of guests? No. The salvation of souls. What is the goal of you living your life and doctrine? The salvation of souls. The goal of prayer. The goal of studying your Bible. The goal of discipling your brothers and sisters. The goal of me preaching today is the salvation of souls. That's why we do this. That's why we are the movement of God, because we want to save souls. Not because we want to sing and dance and do all these things. We do those things because we want to save souls, because we are the souls that have been saved. That is the goal of our faith. That is the goal of our faith. Church, reevaluate. Feed God's sheep. They're not my sheep. This isn't my church, nor is it my Bible talk, nor is that my son, nor is that my wife. This is all the sheep that God has entrusted to us. We all have exousia given to us by God so that we can help each other get to heaven. You guys are incredible. Stop giving up. Never stop the fight. Continue to preach, continue to love, feed God's sheep, and to God be all the glory.